Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Mike Brady here today. Mike has um, not only braved the, uh, the train system, but also various unexploded bombs around the station and goodness knows what, and managed to make it here in the nick of time. So we're, we're grateful to you, Mike. This is really, I suppose, the first you know, official inaugural lecture in this Impact Lecture Series. And the idea of the lecture series, I think, really is to emphasize the fact that uh, doing deep basic research and doing applied research that reaches the world and affects the lives of millions of people, that these two are not at odds with each other. Uh, far from it, they're very much complementary to each other. And uh, I can't think of a better person than Mike to, to introduce the series with this first lecture. Mike is um, about as distinguished as you could possibly get on the academic scale. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, he was, uh, until recently, Professor of Information Engineering at the world's second best university. And I, <laughs> I thought I would say that because I know he would otherwise have made the same joke about Cambridge, so I thought I'd, I'd get in there first. I wouldn't um, demean myself. <laughs> in his, uh, quotes <laughs> retirement, he's Professor of Oncological Imaging at Oxford and uh, runs a number of companies. He ha he's had a tremendously, and continues to have a tremendously successful career, both on the academic axis and on the axis of bringing this research to life in the real world. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Mike. Thanks very much, Chris. And thanks for, thanks for inviting me. I, I love coming to this place. Um, yeah, so uh, I, um, following Chris's suggestion, I wanted to talk about how we can go from whiteboard to, uh, in my office, to white coats, which is what clinicians wear. And uh, so this is a kind of picture of me. Uh, I'll show you a real picture of me in a minute. But basically, as Chris said, I was, um, I did transform from mathematics through computing science to engineering and now into oncology, which seems like a perfectly rational thing to do. Um, but I've also started a number of companies on the right-hand side here. The key point about this is that, um, Unlike this picture, I don't have a split brain. I really do believe that um, rather than keeping these activities separate, that actually they're, they're not only complementary, they're symbiotic. Right? So that many of the problems that we've worked on and we've been, many of the challenges that we've faced in the companies have in fact led to um, you know, a succession of research projects funded by Cancer Research UK or EPSRC um, or, or the EU. Um, and I want to try and give some sense of, of that. Um, most of, um, all I'm going to do today is talk about, I'm not going to talk about the top uh, couple of these. I'm not going to talk about the bottom couple. I'm going to talk fundamentally about medical imaging. And so this is the kind of thing I'm going to talk about, <coughs> where we go from doing the stuff that we get really excited about, which is up at the top there. Um, and this is a particularly simple uh, pair of equations. Um, and what we do from that is I'm going to talk about um, Image Fusion, uh, which is the, the company, uh, uh, the company Mirada. I'm going to talk about um, breast cancer and about computer-aided detection of breast cancer. And then uh, towards the end, fatty liver disease. And towards the end, I, th I thought I would talk about um, what is happening to healthcare informatics. Because we are actually seeing the end of the age of the dinosaurs. And I think people like Microsoft and Google and IBM are going to be the new great players in this space. And it's one of the things that I came to talk to Chris and to Antonio about a couple of, uh, couple of months ago, and again today. So just for those of you who don't know this, um, we've come a long way in about 25 years in imaging. So on the top left, you can see a picture of my brain. Um, and uh, on the top right, you can see a picture of my heart. Um, and um, you here down here, you can see a picture of my uh, spine just after I tried to teach my grandkids how to do a backflip into the pool, um, which was a bloody stupid thing to do, as my wife informed me. I have to confess, this is not my breast. Um, <laughs> and these are a picture of uh, the anatomy, but of course, we've long gone beyond anatomy. And we're now beginning to see, um, first of all, functional information, physiology. And um, so here you can see at the top, you can see now, and this was, that image was taken uh, 12 years ago. So even then you could begin to do some really useful fluid dynamics 
uh, based on the coursing of the blood through my heart. Uh, I have to say my heart's in pretty good nick, actually. Uh, and on the top here, you can see uh, a breast. And if you look in the one that will appear on the right to you, uh, you'll see what looks like a little light bulb turning on. And that turns out to be a carcinoma. Um, and now, of course, we've gone beyond that, uh, beyond physiology. We're now beginning to look really at metabolic information. And in particular, here is a picture of uh, glucose metabolism uh, through positron emission tomography. And even beyond that now, we're beginning to look at how you can image cellular and molecular processes. And one of the, one of the great trends at the moment in image analysis, and I'm delighted I'm still a young bloke, is that um, we're beginning to see this convergence between cellular and molecular biology with um, radiological scale imaging. And that's into what is known as radiomics and theranostics. So that's, it's a very live and it's been changing very much over the past uh, few years. So I'm going to talk about image, images. And, and <clears throat> I thought I would start off by asking, you know, what are images for? And the first, the first thing, but by no means the thing that I'm most interested in, is simply supporting clinicians. And the first of that is enhancement. So this is a, a mammogram, and I'll come back and talk about mammography in a few minutes, but um, this is a particular one where the contrast is too high. There's no information about the breast boundary. The breast boundary contains a huge amount of information about the amount of uh, adipose tissue within the breast. Um, on the other hand, this is an enhanced image uh, of the breast. In fact, it turns out to be a quantitative image of the breast so that the the gray values on the left-hand side mean nothing. It's just a black and white photo, whereas the one on the right, actually those shades of gray convey information, and I'll come on and talk about that. But the most important thing is that you can't just Photoshop these things because uh, the enhancement can't change the diagnostically useful information. You must not add or subtract anything that's clinically relevant. Of course, that presupposes a semantics about what is clinically relevant. A second, thing you, uh, second example is that you can begin not just to do enhancement, but visualization. So this is an example of an MR uh, cholangio uh, pancreatography, MRCP, which is a way in which, uh, in a slightly, um, a slightly invasive manner, one images uh, the biliary structure, the, um, as it were, the, uh, the sewage system um, around the liver. And... Um, this is fundamental to understanding a whole series um, of uh, liver disease, in particular autoimmune diseases and um, uh, things like um, primary sclerosing uh, uh, cholangitis, which I'll come to uh, a little later. So you end up with this, uh, this 3D image, uh, 3D MRI image, and from those we need to be able to extract and to visualize the, the extracted skeletonized biliary tree and then, from those, you need to get numbers. We need to be able to compute the branches. This isn't you know, some fanciful headdress for a, a raster fan. It's um, a measure of the color-coded measure of the, the cross-sectional radius of each of these branches, measuring the, the junction points, and in particular, flagging up dilatations and strictures, because those are the kinds of places where you're going to get pressure points, which lead back to inflammatory bowel disease, and so forth. So that's visualization as the third thing. And the, and, the, and the third example of what most people think about in uh, image analysis is uh, image fusion. And so here, for example, is a cross-section just around here, happily not on me, um, in MRI. And I can tell you that there's a very, very large and extremely aggressive cancer in this image. But you will not be able to see it because cancer is fundamentally a metabolic, uh, a metabolic abnormality. It is not an ab it's not a anatomical abnormality, and this is a picture of, of, of anatomy. However, if you take positron emission tomography and you combine, you fuse them together by uh, registering, co-registering them, then you can see that cancer very, very clearly. But of course, you can't see anything else. So you can see is there's a you have, to take my, you have to take my word for it that this large white blob in the middle is a very aggressive cancer. But of course, now you can overlay those two things and you really can uh, now begin to switch them on and off and you wonder why you didn't see it in the first place. Okay? But that's the kind of work that's going on at the moment with, um, with image fusion. And just to give you a sense of that, 
Um, what you get typically in the case of MR and, um, and PET, uh, in this particular case I'm showing you PET and CT. So CT, computed tomography, is the gray and white stuff. The color is the, is the, the PET information. And basically, uh, if you can see that these are completely uh, misaligned. Um, on the other hand, if you do a rigid body, so you, you restrict yourself to six degrees of freedom, then you can clearly do reasonable job. But actually, you know, as a matter of plain fact, if somebody wanted to do radiotherapy or surgery and they wanted to be accurate to a, within a millimeter, I sure as hell wouldn't trust a rigid body registration. So you want to move to many, many more degrees of freedom, which is in fact deformable image registration. And though you can get these things very, very precise indeed. And these things have got to work, you know, 99.99% .99 of the time, 24 seven. And you've got hundreds and hundreds of degrees of freedom that you've got to control uh, to do this. So, you know, what is this problem uh, underlies this? Um, <laughs> so fundamentally what we do is we, uh, these days, formulate this kind of problem in terms of energy minimization. So we will try to find a transformation between two images I and J, whoops, uh, two images I and J, um, in such a way that, and we'll find a transformation T from some appropriate class of transformations, which might be uh, B splines, they might be uh, whatever, um, and, uh, or they might be various uh, motion fields, and what we'll normally do is we'll have some uh, similarity criterion uh, between the transformed image and, um, and we'll need, because that's effectively an ill-posed problem, uh, we'll then have to add a regularizer, some form of smoothness. Um, and if you do that, then, uh, then you can get uh, from the one uh, to the other and you can begin to um, make these things align and that's fundamentally what was underlying that PET CT I just showed you before. So what's the status of this uh, at the moment? Well, you know, there are uh, thousands of academic publications in this game um, and there's also reality and the two things are intersect in a Venn diagram sense but not by much. So um, generally speaking uh, deformable image registration works pretty well for the brain, uh, but not much else. There are usually promising uh, results are shown at uh, academic conferences, but they're very, very rarely translated into routine clinical practice to work on millions and millions of images. And there are whole classes of clinically important cases, for example, uh, whole body registration. So, for example, in PET-CT, the real driver is you've got a primary tumor, for example, in the lung, but what you really care about here is the distal met met metastatic disease elsewhere in the body. So you've got, to be able to, you've got to be able to align the whole body as taken by PET to a small section of the body as taken by CT. And that's something which actually is quite a challenging uh, problem. Even, the whole, even taking a hold of uh, the large-scale deformation, such as, for example, a lung, because you know, you get, you get very uh, uncooperative patients who insist on breathing. Um, you know, especially if, you know, they get imaged for about 20 minutes and, you know, the, the buggers want to take a breath. I mean, it's really quite um, uh, inconsiderate. Um, uh, yeah? Um, so, why, why does it work so well for the brain? Is that just because the brain <coughs> doesn't deform much? The, the brain does not deform that much. There, there are, in fact, peristaltic movements, actually, Simon, but there's not that much, actually. Um, there's, there's very little in the way of motion. And second of all, um, some of the imaging modalities, but particularly MRI, have been specifically, um, specifically developed to have maximal contrast and spatial resolution for the brain, for example, between gray matter and white matter, between vascular structures and non-vascular structures. Um, but that's the reason why it works particularly well for the brain, um, at least at the radiological scale. Um, again, uh, breath hold. Uh, most people with liver disease, the, the, uh, the median age at which people get liver disease is 75. Most people who have uh, liver disease find it impossible to hold a breath for more than around 12 to 15 seconds. Um, 12 to 15 seconds is a lot. It's very rare that you come across people who are scuba divers um, and uh, come to the hospital. So you have to take images in a whole series of snapshots, and that means... Um, taking uh, images of the deformed love over, over, different, um, over different breath holes. And then finally, in the case of the breast, 
In the case of mammography, the breast is compressed. In the case of MRI, the breast is pendulous. In the case of ultrasound, the, the, the woman lies flat on her back. These are extremely difficult, and uh, generally speaking, the breast is not rigid. The solution to most of these uh, problems is, in fact, to come up with more physiologically plausible uh, constrained optimization or kind of uh, smart uh, segmentation and registration techniques uh, such as pictorial structures, but I'm not going to go in about that today. There are also many practical problems. So, for example, what works for one pair of images, for example, PET-CT, doesn't necessarily work for another pair, for example, uh, MR and PET, and the way to deal with that is to try to incorporate some model of the imaging physics into the registration. I'm going to come on and talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, you, generally speaking, cannot take a pair of images and say to a clinician, come back in four days' time. Um, you know, they want, they, want res they want answers. They prefer to wait an hour. They prefer to have it in 10 minutes, and they prefer to have it in 10 seconds. Um, so we've had, uh, initially, we had one way of dealing with this, and I, th the first of those two statences, sentences is not a joke. Um, in the case of uh, my company, Mirada, what we did was um, we, uh, we went out and bought snooker tables and coffee machines and tried to create a very nice uh, working environment. I can't imagine if I came to Microsoft, I would find anything like a snooker table or free coffee machines or anything like that. It would be far too crass, wouldn't it? Um, um, Don't forget the Xbox. <laughs> and the Xboxes, too. Um, more, more recently, of course, what we've discovered is that instead of actually doing discretization of an underlying continuous problem, which is how I formulated that um, optimization, we've now learned that there are various very, very fast ways of doing discrete optimization. And that has basically, A, brought us much more likely to get to global minima, and B, in a factor of anywhere between a factor of 10 and a factor of 100 faster than we were doing previously. And that's now st standard stuff that we do. Um, and then finally, um, and if, you, uh, if you report a false minimum, uh, you can undermine clinical uh, confidence. I mean, basically, this is a little bit like it's a bitsy spider. You build confidence very, very slowly like that, but you can lose it instantly. I had a very enthusiastic graduate student who went to show the new version of his software to a guy up at the Center for MR in Oxford who pointed out to this clinician that the most enhancing region wasn't the breast, it was the heart. Um, and um, that's where the most vascularized region was the heart. The clinician was absolutely uh, unthrilled by that. Um, and that set us back three, four months to rebuild the confidence of that clinician to work with us. Um, fortunately, now you can, uh, we've now begun to develop um, various smart forms of regularizer, moving towards things like, for example, anisotropic diffusion, uh, or in the case, for example, here, which is very, very difficult uh, in general, we build, a we build a representation which is guided by, uh, as it were, an anatomical map of what you expect to find in here. And that's built in to guide the uh, registration. Regularizer is the smooth. It's the smooth. It's the thing that, you know, it's the thing that actually turns something which is a ill-posed problem into one that's well-posed by adding an additional constraint of smoothness. So, um, <coughs> it originally, the reason why it's called regularizer is nothing to do with all brand. It originally came uh, from dealing with uh, control systems, building optimal control systems um, <coughs> from the 1960s, actually. Um, the real reason why we do medical image analysis is numbers. What we really care about is, and this is, where, this is what is changing medicine, is bringing in numbers. So, for example, here, in the case of PET, uh, what you can get is this standard uptake value, which is a measure of the amount of glycolysis, sugar uptake, um, after a, a particular PET injection. And on the basis of that, you can begin to figure out uh, whether something, for example, is likely to be a tumor, which is the one, that's, um, the one that's shown from the bar on the left, versus the one on the right, which is, in fact, standard brown, brown fat um, that, you will, that everybody has got. More interestingly, though, you'll get patients who will come back over several years. Um, they will have uh, PET CTs. Here I've just shown one that's taken five times over, over three years. We've actually got sequences of, of people f over 15, uh, 15 images over about uh, seven or eight years. And what we're interested in is registering, aligning those images, and then looking at, for example, the... Um, 
the total volume of the lesion um, or the um, avidity of the tumor. And here, for example, on the, on the, on the right-hand graph at the bottom, you can see that despite the fact this person has been under uh, quite uh, aggressive chemotherapy, uh, you can see that nevertheless uh, the avidity uh, of the tumor has actually barely been, uh, has barely been affected. I'd like to talk to you now really about two cases that I'm, I, that was most of that red, just that fusion stuff is about my company Mirada. Uh, and I want to talk about a company of mine, um, Volparo, which I've been working on for 25 years and which started out um, in a pure research project in, uh, in Oxford Engineering in the 1990s. Um, so some, some facts about breast cancer. Um, right now around one in eight women in developed countries will, um, will get breast cancer at some point in their lives. And um, it uh, amounts to around 23% of all cancers in women. And that, that number is set to rise to uh, very nearly 30% uh, by 2030. And the peak incidence is for women between, uh, between 60 and 70. And I'll come on and explain why in a second. Um, just to give you an idea, that number one in eight used to be one in 12 when I started 25 years ago. And at that time, indeed, until about 15 years ago, in developed countries, breast cancer was almost unknown. And it's now already about one in, uh, one in 10 women now in Asia uh, will get breast cancer at some point in their life. It's rising particularly rapidly in Africa. Um, and there were already half a million cases, even, even seven years ago. Um, and the reason for that, it's now become clear that between 95 and 97 percent of breast cancers are not directly genetic or even epigenetic so much as uh, due to extrinsic factors such as toxins, diet, lifestyle, and so forth. And as there's been increasing urbanization in Asia, you've seen this surge in the amount of uh, breast cancer. Now, um, the standard dogma of cancer is that if you can get early detection plus you've got um, a appropriate way, means of intervention, whether it's um, <coughs> chemo or radio cons or conserving surgery, um, and you've got a, uh, a risk analysis, a proper risk analysis, then you can, can transform the figures. So for example, if when a woman, if uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, if a woman was um, diagnosed with breast cancer, they had effectively a 75% chance of dying within five years. Uh, that number now is less than 10%. Um, and actually, um, the thing has changed, you know, the situation has changed dramatically in, um, in, in breast cancer. Unlike, for example, for blokes with prostate, can prostate cancer, where it's a much less happy situation. So the fundamental uh, situation is this, that when a woman goes through the menopause, which is uh, government's decree to be at the age of 50, um, then... Um, what happens in, in many cases is that normal structural tissue, which is milk burring or uh, stromal, converts to fat. It gets stored as fat. It gets stored as a whole series of hormones and fats. And fat is essentially transparent to x-rays. And so it's dead easy to see cancers. In fact, it's hard to think of any imaging modality that could do better for breast cancer than mammography for those women who have normal involution, whose breasts change in that normal way. In fact, you can measure it. It's about 98% effective in that case. However, about 40% of women um, do not have normal involution. The breasts stay uh, stubbornly dense. Um, and uh, it turns out that for such women... The, child, the risk of getting breast cancer is increased by a factor of between six and nine. Um, and um, worse than that, not only is there increased risk, but because the breast remains dense, it's much harder to see tumors because now you're looking for, as it were, a big, big snowball in the middle of a blizzard. Um, and worse yet, um, in terms of the perfect storm, um, it turns out that the, um, the phenotype of the cancer is likely to be more aggressive as well. So it's a total triple whammy. So what it says is, that, and in this case, mammography is no better than a coin toss. Okay? So it turns out then that breast density, the amount of dense tissue, is a vastly, vastly more important and more significant risk factor for breast cancer 
than anything to do with having mothers and sisters and um, you know mother-in-laws twice removed. Um, it, the, the amount of dense tissue. So the question is, can we use that information? And so in the United States, over the past um, five years, there's been a slew of legislation. In fact, it could well be one of the very few things that go onto the <coughs> federal books um, uh, during Obama's period uh, in the last couple of years. But all of these, all of these country, all of these states in green and yellow have now effectively got. Uh, laws that require a woman, when she has a mammogram, to be told her breast density. Okay, And um, one of the reasons why that came around is because you have these advocacy groups in the United States, like Are You Dense, that was run by an inspirational woman called Nancy Capello, and there are various things like the Dangerous Boobs Tour, um, and here are the Dangerous Boobs, um, um, and um, that's me just after I made a donation to their cause. Um, so, this is all very well, but it's welcomed by women. But what exactly is a clinician supposed to report? You're supposed to tell a woman, in fact, you're now legally obliged to tell a woman what her breast density is, but what are you supposed to do? So here, just to give you an idea of the challenge, are two mammograms taken. It's a small hospital a couple of miles south of here, um, in which... Um, these two mammograms, because of the amount of breast dense tissue, we were asked radiologists, two radiologists, as you can see, uh, BK and TLS, to uh, estimate the amount of dense tissue in this woman's breast. And BK estimated 25%, and the woman on the right said 40%, but those two images were taken 10 minutes apart. It's the same woman. Okay? So clearly there's a challenge here. You can't just do it from the image itself. And the answer is, fundamentally, that the one on the left was exposed to x-rays for twice as long as the one on the right. Now, we know that if you manipulate image parameters, you can get very different images. You know, I spend years and years. I love doing photography, and I play around with photography to get various enhanced things, whether it's to do with the amount of exposure time, the, the depth of field, whether it's to do with the film stock I'm using, and so forth. Right? And I do it in order to emphasize those aspects of the scene that most interest us, and the scene out there is the same. And the same is true of medical imaging. But clinicians are told to report uh, judgmentally. So they're given a three uh, particular, uh, four particular, oops, four particular uh, categories. So, for example, the breast tissue is heterogeneously dense, which could obscure uh, detection of small masses, approximately 51 to 75% is glandular. That's a typical instruction to a radiologist. It turns out that the inter-radiologist variation on assigning classes is 35%. That is to say, 3.5 out of 10 don't agree with each other. More, if you take the same radiologist and you present a whole series of images and you randomly put them in, 25% of the time, they don't agree with themselves either. All right? Now, in order to deal with that clear, so you've now got huge variation across women, enormous variation of imaging, enormous, uh, enormously very, very subtle conditions that cost, constitute breast cancer, how can you deal with it? Well, you know, I was in an engineering department. I had a very simple answer. You know, to me, we simply had to build a model of the imaging process and then try to invert that process okay so this is the model that we built I mean I'm not going to go through it but there's a whole book about it so what you have is the x-rays fly, uh, flow down from the x-ray tube you generally speaking you know a lot about the x-ray tube and particularly you know about what its spectrum is that's shown on the right hand side in terms of photon energy versus relative photon count we it's then the breast is compressed in order to spread out um, in order to spread out the dense tissue uh, so that you don't get superposition of uh, a tumor below dense tissue. Um, so you get radiation incidence on the upper plate, goes through the breast and then through the bottom plate, and then exposes a, a sensor that converts directly from X-ray photons to electrons. And if you model all of that, you end up with the equation I've shown down the bottom here. And basically, that piece in there models the breast contents and I'll come on and say a little bit more about that in the middle. But basically, if you want to understand what I spent eight years of my life in Oxford in the 1990s, it was developing this mathematical model of, uh, of a tumor. Are the other bits not fairly fixed? 
It's exactly, that's the bottom of this slide. <laughs> um, so the literature tells us, if we're going to try and make sense of this stuff, the literature tells us, and I believe it's wrong, but the literature tells us that there are two classes of substance. Fat, which is not of clinical interest, that's wrong, but uh, it was deemed not to be of clinical interest, and dense tissue, which is. And they've got very different attenuation or absorption of x-rays. Okay? So um, we call the one interesting and the other one fat. And as it were, the compressed breast thickness we know at any given voxel, any given pixel, is the sum of the amount of fat and the amount of uh, interesting tissue. So we can write down our equation again. Uh, we measure the thing on the left. The thing uh, Simon just pointed out in the middle there, all of those are calibration parameters, or you can get from the DICOM header. They're the amount of the exposure time. They're the amount of the size of the pixel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the uh, bit in the middle here is the compression plates with lucite. Uh, we know that. We know the thickness of the plate. The bit we don't know is, is the H mu. And what H mu is, is for each um, discretized energy, it's the weighted sum of the amount of interesting tissue and the amount of fat tissue. And remember that H fat is plus H int is equal to H. So we can rearrange the equation here to get the one at the bottom. And now, since we now know H fat, if we, knew, if we know these two attenuation parameters, we can solve for H int. And that's exactly what we do. And if we do that, of course, this is massively uh, simplified. I wrote a 300-page book explaining all of this stuff. But fundamentally, what you get is this now. The, um, on the left-hand side, let's take those two images again. The one at the top left, where that particular pixel, we can say that there is 0.4 centimeters of non-fat tissue. And if you look on the one on the right, they had very different exposure. Again, 0.4 centimeters uh, of non-fat tissue. And again, at other places on here. So we started out, we wrote a book in 19, uh, 1999, and then eventually, um, basically, um, uh, 12 years later, uh, that was a, uh, the basis for a regulatory approved piece of software. And what does the software do? Well, basically, it computes for every single point in a mammogram the amount of dense tissue. It can then sum the amount of dense tissue. Therefore, it can estimate the amount of dense tissue, which you recall is the single most important risk factor for breast cancer. But we can also do things like we can uh, compute from that the amount of dose of x-rays. We can figure out the pressure applied to the breast because we can figure out what the area is and they record the force. And we look at the percent density. Just to give you an idea, uh, we started this company in uh, 2009. Uh, we got uh, FDA clearance by 2011. Uh, we got the first part of the uh, program out in 2012. We processed our 4 millionth mammogram um, um, actually that should say 2015 and this year we will pass uh, 10 million mammograms okay 10 million mammograms wait a minute that's minuscule remember there are 75 million mammograms taken per annum and that number is going to rise to 150 over the next five to ten years uh, as it becomes more commonplace throughout Asia and Africa uh, our software is now installed in um, 33 countries um, and the way in which it works, if you remember back to that business about involution, what we have is you take a mammogram, we compute the density score, and in essence, if it's low density, so you remember if it was a fatty breast, then we'll say, Mrs. Jones, you're, you're perfectly fine, there's no evidence of a tumor, come back in two, three years' time. Uh, on the other hand, if it's dense, then you should not be recalled and have another mammogram. That's daft, you're just going to get loads and loads of x-rays. What you should have is an ultrasound on MRI. So one of the things that has turned out to be a windfall for my company is that the insurance companies now in the States accept the quantitative analysis that we do to, re to reimburse a woman who has an ultrasound based on the fact that their breasts are judged to be dense, either by MRI or by uh, ultrasound. So the same piece of physics that underlay that has subsequently gone on to looking at um, the uh, computation of x-ray dose and has gone on to estimate an information system for the breast imaging center. After all, these are the people who've got money, uh, unlike radiologists who like to write papers and see, uh, and see patients and various random things like that. 
Um, and now what we've done is we've now built a cloud-based version of that, which we call Enterprise. And uh, this is, uh, just to give you an idea, we can generate the productivity of a research center by looking at the amount of breast volume image by day of the week. We can look at um, whether or not, you know, for different mammography, mammography machines, how productive they've been. We can look at uh, the amount of x-ray dose that's been given. All of this we can get just on the basis of that physics I showed you. And by taking, since hospitals typically have multiple centers, you really want to pool all of those together in order to, for example, rationally allocate resource, like expensive new machines. And so it's very natural to do this in a cloud-based manner. Um, so uh, that's basically what we're doing. And just to give you, an, just to give you a, uh, just to tell you one thing, and that is that this company, which started out with um, uh, me and one graduate student who actually came from Tony. Tony's uh, master's course in, in Oxford came over and did a, a defill with me in Oxford uh, from 1989 to 1992. We've built this stuff up, waited for the market to, uh, want, to want to get this technology because there's no point in having technology if the market doesn't want it. Um, and now, on the 22nd of April this year, this company will float um, on the uh, Australian Stock Exchange. We've now got something of the order of 45, 50 people working for the company. Meanwhile, I got contacted by an old friend of mine who was also one of the founders of this company, Volpara, a guy named Nico Kasemeyer, who Antonio will know well. That's this guy at the top here. And um, basically what we've been interested in is doing a complementary piece of work, which is in fact applying uh, pattern recognition to uh, mammograms um, to effectively estimate if a clinician taps on a particular point in a mammogram, says, I suspect that there's an abnormality there, uh, will show, in this particular case, I've shown here a cluster of uh, what are known as microcalcifications, which are either calcium salts or magnesium salts, and uh, which are typically, these things are typically um, uh, evidence for what is known as ductal carcinoma in situ, which is the main reason why a woman has a mastectomy. Um, or we can then take and we can uh, link up the uh, images uh, from the previous time, both the craniocaudal and the medial lateral, the medial lateral oblique uh, compression of the view uh, of, of, of the breast. And we can come up by enhancing the probability, which is what's written in red here, we can give a probabilistic uh, assessment of whether or not there's anything serious at that point. Now, of course, at the moment, we've done that in a, for years, uh, Nico and I have done that by uh, sweating and worrying about signal processing and image analysis and various filters and so forth. What we've more recently done is we've applied deep learning to, uh, we happen to have available a relatively small database of around 375,000 uh, cases um, in uh, the University, Radboud University in Nijmegen. And God damn it, within two months, with the deep learning uh, classification system is outperforming what Nico had done um, over 20 years. And that's actually quite interesting. And that's one of the directions we're going. So I was going to say, if only there were an underlying semantics for deep learning as opposed to rabbits out of the hat and black box. And that's exactly, of course, what Antonio is doing. Let me turn to my, uh, my second case. Uh, something, uh, an another example, but again, quantitative analysis to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we've been doing. This is work I've been doing together with Stefan Neubauer in cardiology and a couple of his colleagues, one of whom is a brilliant young guy called uh, Rajashi Banerjee. Um, so this is, this is the, just some basic facts about um, the situation at the moment um, in the Western world which is that somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of uh, Western populations have uh, fatty liver disease. In the, in the UK, somewhere between 15 to 20 million people have got fatty liver disease. Um, of those, about one quarter, so in the UK, somewhere between four and five million, will develop steatohepatitis. I'll explain to you that, what that is in a second. And of those, a very substantial fraction will develop either cirrhosis or and cirrhosis is when the fibrous tissue basically gets like chicken wire and prevents any form of nourishment, so the breast just, so the liver just dies. 
uh, or go straight to hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. Um, it used to be thought that you had to go from um, fatty liver disease to steatohepatitis to uh, cirrhosis and then to liver disease. It's now clear that you can go to liver cancer uh, directly and very early. And why is that happening? Uh, well, you can see that there are a number of um, uh, uh, really quite slim people um, around. Um, and to a very large extent, there are two main drivers for this. One is junk food and fizzy drinks, um, and the other is hep C. I'm not going to talk about hep C or hep B uh, today, um, though that's a part of the story. What I can tell you is, is the numbers are getting to be frightening. There's already 170 million people with uh, serious fatty liver disease around the world. There are, uh, it's projected that will be nearly 400 million uh, by 2030, and you can see the rise in the developing world, the percentage rise in the developing world. Um, worse is the percentage of children, so 20% of children in the EU have got already fatty liver disease and are moving towards uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, or to diabetes, because actually most of these liver diseases are manifestations of the metabolic syndrome, just like diabetes um, or diabetic retinopathy. So this is what a healthy liver looks like, the kind of thing you'd eat. Um, and what happens is, as you develop fatty liver disease, you get these globules of fat. And then, in essence, what you get is this abnormal uh, retention of lipids, that's fats. And that begins to disrupt the normal processes, the normal garbage collection process of the liver. And in essence, what happens is, uh, as that becomes more serious, the amount of fat, the amount of uh, ballooning of cells within the liver increases quite substantially. And at that point, you either move to cirrhosis, which is this horrendously scarred thing that looks like chicken wire on the right, or you get a uh, tumor, which I've shown you here, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so how do you detect uh, liver disease, and it's pretty difficult because it's what's known as the silent killer. Um, you tend to find out only towards end stage that you've got uh, uh, a liver disease. But not always, but, but usually. Generally speaking, the gold standard, as it's called, um, uh, is uh, to have a biopsy. That's a 20-centimeter um, needle. Anybody wants to volunteer to come and have one in Oxford, I'd be more than happy to arrange it. Uh, they're bloody painful. Uh, there is enormous inter and intra rate of variability. About one in 400, there are serious uh, complications. They cost around uh, 1,000 quid to 1,200 quid to the NHS. Um, and for all that, it samples about 1 50,000th of the 2.5 kilogram liver. So this is not a gold standard in the way that I would normally think of gold. What we have done is we've come up with a, um, an MRI test, which is non-invasive, <coughs> and which I'll explain in a second, computes a particular parameter, which we call corrected T1, where the value, 733, 869, 906, etc., that number we have shown is highly correlated with what you would get from biopsy. Extremely highly correlated. Right? So how does that work? Well, it had been known that MR, the T1, the relaxation parameter uh, T1 of MRI, was correlated with histology, but the correlation was very weak. Um, and what we realized was that if you take the uh, average T1 shown on the two left panels there, then in fact that is confounded by the amount of iron within the liver. And there's quite often if you eat excessive amounts of red meat, or you drink uh, large amounts of red wine, then you will have excessive iron within the liver. And that actually, um, that really begins to, that, uh, which is quite abnormal, I've shown it there, basically messes up that measurement. So what we did was we developed some physics that, com that basically corrects that, which is corrected by on every machine, by that, and you get this corrected T1, so while that one looks reassuringly normal, if you understand what the color, and I'll show you what that is in a second, then that indicates uh, severe disease. 
So just by doing that correction, you completely change the diagnosis. Okay? And there's another example at the bottom there. So uh, what we do is we take a, um, a quantitative T1 uh, map. Uh, we take uh, a T2 star um, uh, image, which measures the amount of iron. And at the same time as we do that, we compute a fat map. In fact, for these, we use a particular well-known, pretty much universally uh, uh, deployed sequence known as uh, Dixon. And uh, by combining, by fusing these, these together with a particular uh, underlying physics model, um, we can estimate the corrected T1. And what does the corrected T1 mean? Well, it actually is a score that there is a number in terms of milliseconds, so it has the dimensions of time. But of course, clinicians are used to seeing this underlying histology scale from, from 0 to 4. So what we've done is we've come up with a scale we basically quantize those numbers to give a scale, and we call it LIF. And we call it LIF not because we are uh, keen on Dublin, um, uh, but because, um, because what we've got here is that a measure, what we're actually measuring is inflammation and fibrosis. And it turns out that when you start to get an insult to the body, the inflammation and fibrosis uh, co-evolve. And in essence, what they do is, they restrict the motility of water. If you think about that, um, that chicken wire, which is cirrhosis, you know, the mo once you've excited a proton, it can't go anywhere, can't move. And so its relaxation time becomes lengthened. Right? So that motility of free water, by looking at the corrected T1 of protons, is a very, very strong indicator of the amount of underlying inflammation and fibrosis, and therefore of early disease stage. So we've now got... <coughs> um, so we started this company three years ago. Uh, we got CE marking. Um, um, we've got FDA clearance. We're now selling this, and we're selling this through the cloud as reporting as a service. Right? The whole thing is now being sold as reporting as a service. I'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So a couple of examples. The one at the top here is a simple uh, steatosis. This is a a fatty liver, it should be blue if it was perfectly healthy. It's beginning to get onto the boundary of something that can be concerning. The one down the bottom here, how this guy's walking around is utterly beyond me. Um, this person's either got autoimmune hepatitis or they've got severe, severe uh, disease. <laughs> to give you an idea, here's an example of uh, a lady, 44-year-old lady, who had bariatric surgery. You'll probably read quite a bit about this in the, in the, in the press. Um, so the woman had... Uh, pre-BMI of 34, which is actually quite modest compared with some of the people we see. Um, uh, just to give you an idea, um, we recently had a kid um, who uh, came, uh, a young lad who came to be scanned in, in our center in Oxford. Um, and um, <coughs> he's actually got uh, quite severe uh, steatohepatitis. Uh, the kid's 12 years of age. He already weighs um, 60 kilograms. Um, he's enormous. Um, we told, we told them, the mother, you know, your son has got a BMI of 36. And she said, that's great. It was only 32 a year ago. Right? Such is the ignorance that you have to deal with. Right? So, um, so that's the picture of the liver beforehand. And that's after the bariatric surgery insertion of a sleeve. So you can see that the BMI is reduced from 24, 34 to 24. Well, okay, so the woman lost weight. It doesn't necessarily mean that her liver improved. But actually, we can show uh, in the way we just have that actually this has been a significant improvement um, in the state of this liver. And moreover, should this woman begin to regress to eating uh, garbage again, then that green will change back towards orange at which point you can say, look, lady, uh, you know, you've had your one shot at bariatric surgery. Up to, right now, it's up to you. Um, here's an example of a, uh, a kid, a 19-year-old kid when I saw him, um, who uh, was, being whoops, was being scheduled for uh, a liver transplant. The clinician asked us if we would look at it because he suspected it wasn't quite as bad it uh, wasn't bad enough for a liver transplant. And actually, if you look at it, there's part of the liver, one of the lobes of the liver is actually quite functional, but the other one's completely shot. 
So the clinician put him on a very, uh, a very aggressive, um, a very aggressive um, uh, steroid regime. And just eight months later, you can see that there's been a significant increase in the amount of good tissue in this liver. And uh, one year later than that, the liver is almost entirely uh, good. Of course, you can also see there's a chunk of that's uh, fat, but that's, you know, if you look at any of the uh, weightlifters who are full of steroids, uh, that's the kind of uh, fat that they get. Um, uh, this is happy. That guy was going to have a liver transplant. Now he's completely stabilized on a steroid regime and just got married. Um, we've just run through 3,500 cases in the UK, Biobank. Some of you may be volunteers for Biobank. And what we've done is we've taken the, uh, the fat content, as shown on the left, the uh, iron content, and this corrected uh, score, the lift score, uh, on the right. If you look at the, uh, the government uh, basically decrees that uh, you should have a liver fat content which is less than 2%, which actually makes unhealthy something of the order of 96% of the UK population. This is uh, fat, that's liver fat. This one is liver iron content. This is the lift score. And all I've tried to do is put, uh, I, may, I agree it looks like a Christmas tree. All I've tried to do is to get all, the th all 3,500 data points onto this one this score. Is it's, 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 it's neither, neither here nor there. How many? Yeah, it's just how many. How many? Okay. Right, so the, there's all 3,500 are on here. It just happens to be piled up in, in this way. So, um, even if you take 5%, you can see that there's, um, you can see that there's a, uh, a significant number of people who are beyond that. And actually, of course, by the time you get up here, and remember, these are asymptomatic people walking around the UK, right? And you can look at people who, generally speaking, anything above 20, you are beginning to expect that they will be serious. And if you do the numbers... If you look at the numbers, it turns out to be entirely consistent with that one quarter of the population having uh, NASH. And similarly here. So the point is that we're now doing this. We've just been asked to run this out to 100,000 people. And um, I'll skip over that. I'm going to skip over that as well. Uh, one thing that we've had to do is to show that this thing works on every manufacturer's machine. So we've had 3T for Siemens and Philips and 1.5 for Siemens. And they're uh, all the same. You would, expect, <coughs> you would expect that they will um, lie on a straight line. Uh, that's, that's, basic, that's basic physics of the Lamour equation. Um, so, um, and we can develop nowadays um, enhanced uh, segmentations, probabilistic representations of what's going on inside the liver that, uh, that basically go beyond the basic clinical thing. And now this is being used more and more by pharmaceutical companies who are using these numbers as surrogate endpoints in clinical trials. And just to finish this stuff off, and, uh, is uh, here you've got, whoops, here you've got the uh, biliary tree that I showed you earlier. This is the liver. We can now uh, align this biliary tree uh, onto this. We can do some image analysis to pull off these vascular structures uh, and so forth. So just a couple of slides to finish with. There are a whole series of trends in healthcare above what's happening uh, in terms of science. One, every healthcare system around the planet is increasingly unaffordable. Um, you know, the fact is that people are living longer. Um, people, uh, the taxable percentage of the population is getting smaller. Um, and um, the, the um, and governments are basically refusing to face up to the costs uh, the ticking time bomb of health care. That's led to what is known as the Affordable Care Act in the United States, the ACA, which drives towards things called value-based payments, which basically says, I'm going to give you, you know, $1,000 to deal with a, 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 liver, a liver imaging, and it's up to you guys to figure out how to split it up, rather than what was previously a gravy trail, where you do it on a per-procedure basis, and the more procedures you did, the better. Um, so what that's done is, in fact, it's maximizing the return from existing infrastructure. And what that's doing, in turn, is it's moving from capital to recurrent uh, expenditure, i.e., it's driving things away from selling boxes to selling smart software, application-specific smart software. 
And it's driving things towards big data uh, with cloud and indeed deep learning. Uh, you may know that IBM recently, um, um, uh, IBM, the, the, the uh, Watson, uh, recently bought Merge for a billion dollars uh, in order to get the 7,500 installed base uh, that they've got. So now it's their way of trying to apply the Watson technology to uh, big data. That is but the first of many examples we're going to see uh, in, in that line. Um, and uh, there's increasing uh, inf interest these days in whole life uh, costing for healthcare rather than just individual procedures. And I'm not going to go on about it today, but the link in between what I've been showing you, which is radiological scale, to uh, genetics and epigenetics through what is known as radiomics and theranostics. I'm not going to talk about that at all. Just want to leave you with one thought. Up until about 10 years ago, medical imaging, which is a three, um, a three four billion dollar industry, was dominated by big iron companies. Uh, GE, Philips, Siemens, Toshiba, and nowadays Samsung. And these devices were effectively islands on which things happened. Um, big iron, as they're called, whoops, as they're called these companies, big iron did not understand software, and to a very large extent still does not. And therefore, innovations took years to get to market. Uh, to give you an example of that, at the time that we did a management buyout of um, a piece of what had been the former Mirada from Siemens in uh, 2009, uh, late 2008, 2009, uh, we started to work on the same kind of device, having, having to start from scratch, as Siemens were working on, and with one half the number of people, and within two years, we had a product that was FDA cleared, and five years, six years later, Siemens still did not have the product out on the market. And that's because they're completely and utterly process-bound, right? Whereas you've got the agility of small companies. So innovations took years to get to market. So that's the way it was. And then, of course, what happened was that people begin to build file servers, particularly for image data, inside hospitals. And these were known as PACs, Picture Archiving and communica Communication Centers. And you might think, well, that's just a, you know, what the hell, that's just a local area network. It had one profound effect on hospitals, namely, where an image is produced is no longer where it's stored, and that's no longer where it's read. It actually separated out three functions that previously had been collocated around the machine. Okay? And what that did was, in order for that to happen, we began to find file standards for all of the images through things like DICOM, which in fact shifted things away from hardware towards smart software. Image is merely one example of that. And now what we're seeing is cloud is beginning to uh, completely accelerate this trend. So um, all, of the, all of the real practical issues to do with the fact that you had to deal with constraints on the communication of pa patient data, which in the United States are things like HIPAA, uh, are now being overcome. The de-identification of patient data is now kind of routine, although five years ago people worried about it. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the idea that you would do the worldwide wait uh, for an image um, you know, is now with the increased bandwidth is much less of a problem. Automatic billing for services is now fairly routine. Um, and more importantly, cloud is now encouraging recurrent expenditure through subscription models of payment. So to come back to what I was kicking off to talk about, the road from whiteboard to white coat is, in fact, uh, strewn with rocks. Um, you know, you can't just take a smart idea. Uh, what you have to do is you've got to go through regulatory clearance with CE, with the Federal Drugs Administration, FDA clearance. You've got to go through a whole series of quality processes. You've got to worry about interoperability through the DICOM jungle. There are any number of routes to market, whether it's thick client, thin client, uh, cloud. You've got to start worrying about insulin, insulation, maintenance, and so forth. Well, you know, that's a big deal for people in the university who want to get out and do a company based on some smart algorithm. It sure as hell isn't a problem for Microsoft. You know, most of this stuff is routine for you guys. So what does a wannabe pro provider uh, do? Well, you know, 
uh, if you're in a university and you want to do this kind of stuff, you want to get some stuff out to be used by clinicians, step number one is you bite the bullet and you just do it, and that's what I've done uh, through each of my companies. Or you can outsource to somebody who's already got all of those um, uh, regulatory capabilities and, and, and quality uh, approvals, and that's what we did first at uh, Perspectrum Diagnostics. We outsourced to Mirada, and now we've built our own, um, and so we're now doing our own stuff in-house. Or you can outsource the development. You know, you can, uh, somebody in a, a university, you know, even a, even a piddly little one here, you know, you can, you can see people come out of engineering or computing with a really, really good idea, and they may say, you know, here's a great idea, here's a great app, I just don't, I can't deal with all that other stuff, right? Now, so how might you respond? Well, you know, you might actually, uh, you've got cash, and you could also take equity, right? So they can get some sweat equity, but, you know, you can take equity as a company. So one of the issues is, what might Microsoft do? Thank you. Time if you just take one or two very quick questions. I'm going to be around if people want to talk. Yeah. How many 50 people in the area of computing gear described at the start? How many of them are writing algorithms and how many of them are dealing with the regulatory? Uh, good question. Um, so, um, generally speaking, um, I guess uh, a typical company, um, we would have um, about um, if I look at my companies, and I try roughly in my head to do this, I would say a third of the people are involved in uh, finance, business development, sales and marketing. Um, although, of course, you know, doing sales and marketing, if you're dealing with cloud and cloud services, are very, very different from having you know, um, boots, on the, boots on the street going and banging on hospital doors. It's a hell of a lot easier. You can deal with a lot leaner uh, organization. But about a third... Um, are sales, marketing, finance, admin um, uh, types. Um, of, the, of the other two-thirds, I would say, um, um, so that's 60%, I would say something of the order of around uh, 10, 15% tend to be scientists, engineers, developing next-generation product. Um, and then uh, the remainder, so a half, uh, we would, because my companies are all software companies, they would be split into the people who are doing the prototyping, uh, the people who are doing the, um, the real development, um, and the people who are doing testing and maintenance. And uh, we've always organized the companies, in fact, you pretty much have to, so that the people who are doing the testing and the troubleshooting are completely separate from the people who are doing the developing and the people who are doing the actual developing of uh, the stuff, again, again, formal specifications, are different, again, from the people who are coming up with the algorithmic ideas. And we have very rigid, uh, <coughs> very rigid processes. Is that forced upon you by the... No, 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 no. It's something that, it's something that, uh, something that we did. Um, I became very, um, um, you know, I became uh, very convinced. Um, it was kind of in the, uh, it was in the water in Oxford that you had to think about... Uh, you know, formal specifications. I suspect formal specifications for me aren't what, uh, say, uh, Tony would have uh, done in the, uh, in the Z days in 19... But, but that, the, rigorous, the rigorous specification of software um, um, through a mixture of um, um, documentation, examples, etc., uh, code um, that would be then uh, translated to the people who are actually building... The, uh, I didn't want the people who were doing that creative stuff to be worried about interoperability, DICOM, mm. interaction with the networking, and so forth. And then you must have people who are trying to break the stuff on a regular basis before it goes out the door. So we've always had that very, very, uh, very, very rigorous structure to the company. And it's one of the reasons why we have very, very few failures in the field. Um, you know, because the cost of dealing with something, not just in terms of money, but in terms of reputational damage, if you put something out that doesn't work, 
is just immense. Um, so, you know, especially when you're dealing with healthcare, you know, you really, it's really got to work absolutely right out all the time. Yeah. So that's roughly the breakdown of, uh, of the people that we have in the companies. In the interest of time, we'll, um, we'll pause the, the formal Q&A there. Um, uh, I know that you've rearranged your day a little bit in light of oh, the sort of bomb <laughs> incident, and you'll be here for a little while longer. So anybody who wants to get a bit of time with Mike, just let me know. Um, very timely, actually a very exciting message. Of course, we've just launched our own medical imaging yeah. analysis group headed by Antonio, so it's a, a very upbeat message about the, uh, the potential of this uh, technology for the future. So um, with that, let's just thank Mike for a great talk.